Turn with me, please, if you will, to the book of Second Chronicles. You know where that is? Don't go there often, right? Second Chronicles. And chapter 29. I don't know. I may have preached something similar to this in the past because... Every time I, I'm reading through the Bible, I'm reading passages, you know, and sometimes you have similar thoughts, right? And uh, I don't keep real close track of the messages that I've already preached. This isn't, I don't go back and, and, and uh, take messages and re-preach them. I get fresh thoughts and uh, work through them. But, uh, often on a Wednesday night, the, the things that I do share just come from personal devotional time, uh, just some seed thoughts that then I develop uh, as I meditate upon them more. That's what this is. It's actually based upon the 29th and the 30th chapter of Second Chronicles. And it really is, it's an incredible account. You know, some moments are just more significant than others. And what happens here in chapter 29 is one of those times that the Bible would call a holy time. Have you ever had one of those? The Bible is just full of what I would call divine moments that are worth more than any other moment. Have you had one of those? And if so, have you had a divine moment recently? Here's a question. Can a few moments in a person's life make such a difference that that person is never the same afterward? You know, there's a lot of Bible stories that fit that very pattern. A burning bush and Moses is never the same and Israel is delivered. Or Isaiah has a vision of the temple in heaven and Israel hears the word of God. Even at the expense of Isaiah's life. Or Saul of Tarsus. He has a vision on the, on the Damascus Road, and the Greco-Roman world is evangelized. So one moment with God changed these men's lives. These are times, these divine moments, these are times that don't last long, but all human history is different because God came and he, and he made an ordinary moment into a divine moment. And I believe that 2 Chronicles chapter 29 really sets the table for a divine moment. What you have recorded happening in the next chapter, in chapter 30, is a what I would call a super Passover uh, celebration. And even though it's celebrated a month late and it is yet extended for one more week instead of seven days, they went 14 days. And it just reminded me, you know, God will overlook the letter of the law because he's more interested in us fulfilling the spirit of the law. And that's what happened there in the 30th chapter. God's divine moment in this chapter involves King Hezekiah and all of the people of Judah. And it takes place in the temple, in Solomon's temple. Because the temple is the place where the nation of Israel met God and would experience divine moments. You know, there were three parts in Solomon's temple, right? Just oversimplification. But there was a courtyard, 
Then there was the sanctuary where the priests and Levites ministered. And then there was the Holy of Holies, three parts. Have you ever related those three parts to the three parts that make up a human being? You know, God often deals in triads and threes. The temple had three main parts. We have three main parts, body, soul, and spirit, right? And I think there's a parallel because we are called the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I want to make that that, uh, leap, which really isn't much of a leap because I think it could be reason from the scripture itself. But what I want to think about in the minutes that we are here in this passage is what then are the steps? What are the steps to a divine moment with God in his temple? We see what the steps are for a divine moment for Hezekiah and the people of Judah in the temple made with hands and how that might relate to what are the steps for a divine moment for the temple of God, which is human beings that are in a relationship with him? Well, that's where I want to go tonight. And uh, it begins in verse 1 of chapter 29, Hezekiah, good old Hezekiah. He messed up in the end, but overall, he was a good king. He wanted to do right. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mom's name was uh, Abiyah, daughter of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. I'm going to stop there, have a word of prayer, and then I want to look at the first step in a divine moment in the temple. Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us together once again tonight. Would you guide our thoughts? Would you make this a spiritually profitable time? Would you use this in every single one of our lives? Anyone who is listening to this, may their heart be softened, tenderized, searched, known by you, revealed, exposed, and made right. We just thank you tonight that we can we can come before you like this and expect you to do what only you can do. Lord, we as individuals and as a church, we need a divine moment. Just as Hezekiah himself and the people of Judah experienced, we need a divine moment like this. So badly, so much, Lord. So please, would you in your graciousness, in your gracious dealings with us, enable us to have such a time. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at verse 3 as we continue reading. He, that is King Hezekiah, in the first year of his reign, 25 years old, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Now, stop there. Why were the doors of the temple shut anyway? Well, his dad was a rabid idolater. His dad was Ahaz. His dad was so wicked as a king that he offered up Hezekiah's brothers as infant sacrifices to the heathen god Molech. He was a wicked king. He defiled the temple. He desecrated the temple. He set up idols in the temple. He shut up the doors of the temple so that he could could proliferate idolatry all over the land of Judah. So the first thing that good Hezekiah does, as we read in that sentence in verse 3, 
he reopened. He reopened the doors of the house of the Lord. I would say the first step to a divine moment in your temple with God is there has to be a reopening. You, I wonder, have you deliberately closed your heart's door to God in some way? Or does it need to be opened wider than it is currently? Have you neglected to be open to the presence of God on a daily basis in your life? Do you need to open your door, the heart door of the temple of your life to the God of glory? Until you open the door, until you reopen the door, there's not going to be a divine moment. It reminds me of the pleading of Jesus to a church an entire church like this in the ancient city of Laodicea. Behold, he said, I stand at the door and knock. Why is the Lord of the church having to knock to get entrance into the church? Because spiritually, they had locked the door to him. They had shut him out. And they needed to reopen the door. And perhaps we as a church, perhaps we as individual temples of God need to reopen spiritually to the presence of the Lord. Or we'll never have a divine moment until, first of all, we, 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 there's a reopening. But look at verse 3 again. He said, It says, he not only opened the doors of the house of the Lord, he repaired them. He repaired them. The doors needed to be repaired. You know, there might be areas of your life, your life with God that need to be repaired. It may not just be the doors, the opening to God for a divine moment. There might be areas of your life that need to be rebuilt. Maybe you need to rebuild the altar of time with the Lord. Maybe you've let it fall down in ruins, your time with the Lord. If you don't have time with the Lord on a daily basis, then either you're just negligent or you're too busy. I've heard someone, I've heard of someone famous say, a very busy person, I'm so busy, I have to spend hours with the Lord today. You will be amazed at how much more you will accomplish if you will do that, if you will put a premium on opening and repairing the altar of your time with God. You'll be amazed at how much you will accomplish that otherwise you wouldn't. Perhaps you need to repair and rebuild the altar of repentance before God. Maybe you've let the altar of your love for Christ fall down in ruins. Or the altar of, of a selfless sacrifice slip into disrepair. Another church that Jesus speaks to, he says, I have somewhat against you because you've left your first love. Maybe that's what needs to be repaired in your life. You've left your first love. I should ask you this. Is there, is there something or someone in your practice, in your life, that you love more than Jesus? Even a spouse. If you have to disobey God in order to obey a spouse or to please a spouse, then you love that spouse more than you love Jesus. 
Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yea, his own life also, he can't be my disciple. Doesn't mean he can't be saved, but he can't be my follower, my true follower. That's what he says here. Is there something or someone in your practice that you love more than Jesus? So in the first year of his reign, Hezekiah opened the doors of the house of the Lord and he repaired them. Verse 4, and he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the east street. Verse 5, and he said unto them, hear ye, hear me. Ye Levites, sanctify, set apart now yourselves and sanctify, set apart the house of the Lord, God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. The holy place was the sanctuary. The most holy place was the holy of holies. So he's telling the priests and the Levites, You need to get the garbage out of the holy place so that the priests can once again minister because his father Ahaz had desecrated it and it was filled with filthiness. That's what verse 5 says. So here's a third step to a divine moment. Not only reopen and repair, but here, remove... In verse 16, and the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it, and they carried it out abroad into the brook Kidron. They threw it into the dump, the Jerusalem dump. They removed it. Third step to a divine moment, there needs to be a removal. Need to get rid of the junk that you've let into your life. It needs to be cleaned out of your temple. The defilement that you have allowed to enter and to remain in your temple, in your life, needs to be removed. Is your temple filled with worldly and personal clutter? Do you hold on to, are you hoarding things that are important to you? Maybe forms of entertainment or music or relationships that have absolutely no eternal value? Something that God is asking you to let go of? In that same 14th chapter, Jesus challenges any would-be follower with these words. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. There's a need for removal. You want a divine moment? You're really serious about it? Got to reopen, reopen, open the door, open your heart's door, open it wide, do the repair, remove the filth, And then look at verse 19. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz, that's Hezekiah's evil daddy, which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his sin and his transgression, have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. This is is what the, the priests and the Levites have said. You know what the fourth step is to a divine moment with God? Got to reopen, got to repair, got to remove, four, got to refurnish. Got to refurnish the temple. You need to take steps to recover and to set up things that will contribute to a divine moment with God. You have to put things in place that are conducive to a divine moment meeting with God. You need to rearrange your priorities, so that seeking God is your first priority. Not your job, 
not your family, not anything. Seeking God is your first priority. When you make your plan for the day, seeking God is your first priority, nothing else. I think we have family and friends and activities and our job and our education and our leisure, restful time. We have all of these things and others displacing our opportunity for a divine moment with God. And it's no wonder we're in the condition we're in. It's no wonder we don't have them. It's no wonder we never experience a divine moment. Because we haven't reopened, we haven't repaired, we haven't removed the filthiness, we haven't refurnished. There's one more step, a fifth step that I see in this chapter. Verse 35. And also, the burnt offerings were in abundance. This is when they had everything done. The burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And I just say that the sacrifices, let them begin again. And that I call rededicate, rededicate. For a divine moment, there has to be a reopening. There has to be repairing. There has to be a removing. There has to be a refurnishing, and there has to be a rededicating. A time to reaffirm your yieldedness and your oneness of purpose. You know, you can bemoan family and financial situations, but you always need to be certain that you're not contributing to the problem by your self-centered, unspiritual personal choices. I thought that through, that sentence, that wording. I think I should repeat it because I believe God gave it to me. And that is simply this. You can bemoan your family or financial situation, but you always need to be certain that you're not contributing to the problem by your self-centered, unspiritual personal choices. It's past due time to settle and experience your divine moment with God. Because if not now, then when? You know, I believe that there ought to be multiple divine moments in all of our lives as believers. And I think that some of them ought to be predictable, like this one. We ought to come like Israel's feast days to God. We ought to set apart uh, time for holy days. Did you know the word holiday comes from the phrase holy day? We ought to have those kinds of holidays, holy days. I want to challenge you and I to set time apart and allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify it so that you're available and you're open to anything which God wants to call you to. When was the last time you set apart time, a day for God in your life? When have you last scheduled a holy day? You've scheduled holidays. When have you scheduled a holy day, a holy day with God in which you desire a divine moment? And when you have that, when you experience a divine moment like we have here in these two chapters, you ought to record it. The Holy Spirit saw fit to record it for us here. You ought to record it in your spiritual journal. There are times that, of course, divine moments are, are really, they are holy times. And maybe they're they're too holy to 
expound on and to share with others. But share it with yourself and keep a record of it. In fact, as I said at the beginning, if you ever have a true divine moment, you'll never forget it. <clears throat> It'll be with you. I think I've had more than one. I remember one particular one though. And again, I know these are these are personal and 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 special times. But I was in a, a, it was a revival conference, actually. And I, I, I was one of the speakers in it. This was years ago. And I remember this elderly man. He's still living. Richard Owen Roberts. He was one of the speakers. And I remember when he spoke. Somewhere in that message. I don't know what it, I, I can't remember exactly uh, what part of the message, but I remember what he was speaking on. He, he chose that phrase <clears throat> of John the Baptist when he was talking about Jesus who was going to come and baptize you with the spirit and with fire. And I remember that when he began to talk about the fire, baptism of the Holy Ghost, that my heart was just gripped. So much so that I could not contain it. And I verbally, in the midst of all the others, I verbally gasped out loud and groaned. And I was so overcome by the Spirit of God at that moment, I actually got up and left, and I went up to my room in the hotel that we were meeting in, and I'm telling you, the Lord came into that room. And I had my own meeting with the Lord. It was a divine moment. That's just a, a, a quick example or sample. God wants us to have these on a regular basis. He wants us to reopen. And then when we re reopen, re repair, remove, refurnish, and rededicate. Those are the five steps in that chapter 29 that led to a wonderful divine moment. They had a tremendous super Passover that's explained in chapter 30, which we're not looking at tonight. But I want to challenge you. Set apart time for a divine moment, and it'll happen. God will meet you.